welcome you all to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum third Sunday lectures, <laughs> which we try to put on every month, thanks to John Devino, who is actually taking a tour up to the house right now, so he will be back. But anyway, uh, that's what we do, and we welcome you, and so glad to see you, and so glad to be part of the archaeology uh, lecture series uh, this year, and so uh, very special to have Jess here with us today. Uh, Jess is Vermont State Archaeologist. He works within the Division for Historic Preservation in Montpelier. He's a native Burlingtonian, just received his BA in Anthropology and English from the University of Vermont in 1999. I think someone took that from the <laughs> bio. <laughs> his MA in Literature from the University of Kent in 2001, his MA in Anthropology from the University of Alba Albany, SUNY in 2008, and his PhD in Anthropology from the University of Albany, SUNY in 2015. During much of that time, Jess was also a research supervisor at the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program. So quite a lot of uh, good academics here. As the state archaeologist, Jess is centrally concerned with the stewardship, preservation, and interpretation of Vermont's rich archaeology, archaeological past. Excuse me. His own research explores issues surrounding Native American long-distance material exchange, ritual elaboration, and social crises, and these phenomena are evidence in the Northeastern archaeological record. He has authored or co-authored a number of journal articles, <coughs> book chapters, conference papers, and techno technical reports about these and other topics. So let's all welcome Jess here today. Thanks, all. I really appreciate it. I had, uh, I had little doubt that there would be uh, this many, or little uh, hope that there would be this many people on such a gorgeous late summer day. But uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I am the state archaeologist and uh, with the Division for Historic Preservation. Uh, and combined with my colleagues at the Agency of Transportation, every year we sponsor a month-long program of events, workshops, lectures, and other um, events called Vermont Archaeology Month. And, uh, this is one of those events, and um, so thank you all for participating in this and for helping it to make such a great month. Uh, one of my former coordinators is sitting way in the back, Emily Cryan, uh, and uh, we've uh, made great strides over the years, thanks to, in part to her, the other coordinators, uh, this year's coordinator, Brett Ostrom, and I want to give all the, the credit to them as well. So I was here in March, and uh, I gave, um, uh, somewhat of a general overview of Vermont archaeology, concentrating a little bit on Chittenden County, but uh, doing the broad strokes through time and chronology. And, and uh, I was asked back uh, and uh, to coincide with Vermont Archaeology Month. And I said, well, OK, let's make it a little more specific this time relative to uh, the Burlington Intervale, where the Ethan Allen Homestead is, and where um, so much is uh, known um, or at least thought to be known about archaeology in the region. Certainly some of our um, most important archaeological sites that we hang our hat on in this region were known from the Intervale. But I have to say in preparing this talk, not, not only did I find it um, difficult to get around the nuances of this area, but also how to interpret that for uh, this audience. And so it's a, it's a lesson to me and also uh, hopefully um, a work in progress. And, and one of the things I, I will note uh, at the outset is there's a remarkable wealth of information about the environment, about the hydrology, the forest communities, the wetlands, the, the uh, indigenous species. And um, it's, there is a lacuna in tying that back to the ancient past in archaeology. So um, this talk is sort of uh, reinvigorated for me uh, a long-term project to synthesize uh, this uh, data about the ancient past to inform <coughs> all of that and, and make it better uh, for all of us. So with that, um, we'll just get going with uh, Lisa Brooks, who I just noticed uh, her book is in, the, uh, is in the book room, and I might very well buy it at the conclusion of this talk. Uh, and she summarizes 
what uh, a Wolonak or um, intervale uh, in Abnaki is, the fertile bowls between mountain ranges that were capable of sustaining many families who gathered there forming permanent communities. Uh, an intervale is an old term uh, that's somewhat been superseded by other terms and yet we still use it intermittently here in Vermont and you can find them on old maps, again talking into these uh, valleys between mountains. Um, the intervale itself uh, is relatively recent geologically and hydrologically. Uh, 12,000 or 13,000 years ago to after 10,000 years ago, the Champlain Sea overlied what is now uh, much of the Champlain Lowland, including the Intervale area, um, up to a certain stretch anyway. Um, and after it receded, and during the process of the Champlain Sea's recession, the Winooski Delta was built out through all the outwash um, of sediment left over by the glaciers and ground out from uh, the mountains and other areas. So the Winooski Delta is actually uh, very recent within the last 10,000 years or, or so and was a build out of all of this sediment washing in from uh, interior margins and left over from the Champlain Sea. Um, the Winooski River itself, whose Abnaki name uh, resides at the top, Winostakak, um, or Onion River, uh, although as it flows through the delta, it's quite recent, it is uh, a very ancient river that predates uh, the, at least the last several glaciations and um, ran through the mountains at a very distant time period. So it is a very old river, although the stretch here in the Intervale is quite recent, at least in its current iteration. Um, the next few slides uh, I've borrowed from the Lake Champlain Basin Program and their, and their um, various reports. They do remarkable jobs with graphics and, uh, and uh, I couldn't regenerate it better if I tried, so I'm borrowing them. But here what we have, and you can see it's cut off a little bit at the bottom, but here what we have is the extent of the Lake Champlain Basin watershed. It is absolutely enormous uh, compared to most equivalent lakes. And in fact, you can see here this, well, it's cut off, but you can see here that um, over 90% of the water that flows, that uh, comprises Lake Champlain flows from surrounding watersheds or sub-basins. And that uh, the watershed ratio of lake to watershed is 18 to one, whereas uh, the Great Lakes is two to one. So we have 18 times as much water, or actually nine times as much water, uh, flowing into Lake Champlain from surrounding basins than a, than a typical lake like the Great Lakes would have. This obviously has implications in the modern area for phosphorus load and other things because such a vast array um, of uh, streams and feeder streams, uh, tributaries and major rivers feed into Lake Champlain. But it also meant in the Native American and early historic past that all of these uh, various and quite extensive systems were tied back in, into this central place, uh, the Lake Champlain. You could always follow many of these rivers back uh, and get to the lake or streams. And in particular here is the Winooski River watershed, a very large watershed within the uh, Lake Champlain basin system. Just zooming in a little bit further, six major rivers and tributaries feed uh, the Winooski. Uh, just to zoom in here, again, an extensive system. And all of those eventually pass through this Intervale region on its way out to the lake. So we are uh, at the base of this, uh, this system. Now, uh, in preparation for this talk, I grabbed a recently generated LIDAR of uh, a portion of the Intervale here. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see in this light, and I do apologize because um, a couple tiles came in, and I, I need to talk to the Vermont Center for Geographic Information about this, where they, they um, uh, store and make available for free all of this data. But certain tiles came in with tree cover here, and then certain tiles without, and I got them from the same store. So I'm not sure what's up. But in any case, it, it, I thought I would leave it in rather than bending over backwards so you can get a, a comparison of what it's like when you have uh, LIDAR which picks up the tree cover. And if you zoomed in, you could get even individual trees. Again, LIDAR stands for Laser uh, Light Ranging and Detection. 
It uh, is flown from a plane and shoots lasers to the ground uh, at uh, you know roughly half a million times a second. And those bounce back, or a large percentage of them bounce back. They calculate the time and the distance between the bounce back, and they're able to then, much like radar or sonar, get a map of the topography. But what is wonderful about LIDAR, uh, over and above its um, accuracy, which is generally less than a meter from a plane, uh, is that enough of those pulses get down to the forest floor, even through the trees, that then um, in post-processing, you can um, say, well, these aren't the ground, these are trees, these dots, and factor them out, essentially removing the tree cover of any given area. So this is a boon for archaeologists because it's essentially uh, uh, electronically or through software move, removing the forest to see what the bare earth is like. And so in one of the derived products is often called bare earth LIDAR. So here you can see uh, these tiles where um, all the tree cover and vegetation is removed. And we'll be returning to these slides throughout the talk, but I do want to um, draw your attention to, here's the uh, um, Ethan Allen Homestead area, but all these relict oxbows coming through, um, showing the dynamism of the Winooski River through time. Um, again, uh, below the falls, uh, it picks up some speed and certainly picks up uh, volume as it flows out toward the lake. Just another image of the Winooski River Intervale area. And uh, I have to give credit to both Pete Thomas, the old um, uh, director of the UVM Consulting Archaeology Program, uh, who did these original maps in the 1980s, and then uh, John Kroc for digitizing them and uh, loaning them to me for the purpose of this talk. But um, to show the vast meanderings of the, of the Winooski River in the Intervale area through time, the, brown, the, the blue is the modern day, or you know, within the past 10 years or so, river. Um, the brown is the 1802 trajectory of the Winooski River, 1830, 1869, 1894, and then these are all overlaid. And you can see the vast movement of the river in only roughly uh, two, 200, 180 years. Now. Archaeologically, and we'll show this, we have seen this through time going back at least three, four thousand years. Um, but it is quite clear that uh, in the modern era or in the historic era, that this has increased the sediment loads and the meandering and dynamism of the river have increased markedly. Uh, one notable thing was out at the Howe Farm on uh, North Ave, a, 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 a component of this intervale system. Um, when the Northern Connector was built, uh, they borrowed a, a, a load of sediment out of one area to, area to make the road, which formed a sort of pond, but it was essentially dead because um, not knowing anything at the time about wetland or water body regeneration, the sides were too steep, and so no, no vegetation could really um, uh, catch hold and, and, and reform a functioning wetland system. So the, uh, the EPA and the Army Corps in the early 2000s decided that they needed to taper the sides more of this pond in order to regenerate uh, uh, vibrant wetland communities. But because they were going to uh, potentially intact, uh, impact archaeological resources, um, uh, UVM, of which I was a part at the time, went out to do um, some soil profiles to see what it was like. So here you can see uh, this is roughly five feet down. We're cleaning the profile walls to try to get uh, the mapping of, uh, of sediment through time, trying to find archaeological sites. But at the end, what we saw is this series of flood zones, um, major floods. You can see separated through time and space. And though you can't see uh, the words down there, at the very bottom of this, we radiocarbon dated a log to 1880. So all of this sediment is post-1880. So massive, massive uh, flood sediment deposition um, and why was this? And here's just another map from um, the fluvial study uh, from the Intervale area. And all of these arrows indicate pre-1900 um, oxbow systems. Um, so this is a massive movement of the river. Um, the blues are between 1802 and 1857. The reds are between, uh, I can't tell, but sometime after that. <laughs> um, and then the greens, 
our oxbows abandoned pri prior to 1802. And you can see these are probably quite ancient, but all the vast movement since that time. And why was this? Well, certainly there's a variety of factors, but probably the biggest one is uh, forest clear cutting uh, for habitation and settlement. This is just a diorama from the Harvard forest, which doesn't depict Vermont, but is, d does depict a typical New England scene of uh, you know, uh, minor woodlots, but otherwise denuded hillscapes with um, uh, bounded hills and uh, farmers, hill, hill farmers planting uh, plots. This, though, is from Underhill. And again, I have to give credit to John Kroc, who alerted me to this yesterday when I was at another Vermont Archaeology Month event. And this is a, an early uh, single room schoolhouse in Underhill. Um, but note the totally denuded hillside all the way in the back, right down to scrubland. Um, and this would have fed eventually through the dog into the Winooski. And you, if you just imagine the sediment load. And um, I forgot to ask uh, uh, Kate Kenny from the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology program about this yesterday, but I do remember her doing some research on the early uh, residents of the Burlington area and talking about how the 1830 flood, which um, was probably worse than the, eight, than the 1927 flood, except had much less uh, in, you know, human impact because there were so much fewer people living in here. But she, rem she recalled seeing a newspaper article where they thought that it was the end of the world on the Intervale because the entire thing was essentially um, drowned and uh, Burlington on the hill was essentially an island. Um, so remarkable. And then again, more recently in Hurricane Irene, um, you can say here's the community farm. So um, clearly we have a dynamic river system here near the mouth uh, toward Lake Champlain. Um, and uh, the dynamism can be certainly destructive, as you probably all know here, but also uh, enabled vast fertility, particularly when these flood episodes were somewhat arrested or made um, farther apart in time or less severe uh, due to forest cover. Um, and just to give you now, situate you uh, in the uh, native past, here's a map of um, uh, you know, sort of the tribes at the time of early European contact and their rough approximate boundaries. And here we have the Western Abnaki right here located in this region. And again, <laughs> returning to the uh, Intervale area, um, remarkable place, not just for its uh, fertility, uh, you know, soil fertility, which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, the host of species that were able to come down here. And I saw the, 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 the diorama as we walk in, showing some really great uh, variety, but um, one of the most biologically diverse areas in, this, in the state uh, with many recorded species of mammals, waterfowl, fauna, um, other fauna, amphibians, um, foodstuffs, uh, edible plants, non-edible plants, um, and just some of these areas here, this cute little beaver. Uh, extremely important for as both a food source, but more prominently for food and uh, for um, uh, tools. Beaver teeth were extremely important tools for woodworking and other things. Um, uh, forget this caribou down here. I forgot to take him out. But <laughs> obviously, uh, moose and deer, extremely important. Um, salmon, um, you know, as the, where the salmon hole gets his name, this would have been an important fishery uh, uh, in time prior to damming and, uh, and uh, hydrologic um, change. And then waterfowl, um, extremely important uh, in seasons um, for uh, food and for fall st storage. Um, and then this is, a, this is an inset zoomed in from uh, Champlain's 1612 <coughs> map of, um, of uh, North America as then known. Uh, particularly New France. And you can see here a Jerusalem artichoke that um, my colleague Fred Wiseman pointed out in an earlier publication. Um, onions here and a variety of other species including bean um, that would have uh, been procured by Native Americans again. Um, and Champlain as he came into Lake Champlain region uh, in 1609 remarking uh, that uh, the rivers had were productive in grain such as I had eaten in this country together with many kinds of fruit without limit. Um, 
And just parenthetically, uh, I found this um, right online. And uh, for those of you who are scholars of the Intervale, uh, it's Catherine Bloffson. She wrote a master's thesis called Intervale Out Loud, a place-based oral history project. And I thought it was really great uh, and certainly um, does a great job of synthesizing a lot of oral history about the Intervale area. So I, I, I've never met her. I don't know her, but I found it online and uh, it was a great document. Um, you all are probably familiar with this quotation, uh, but for those of you who aren't, I will read it out. I explored the Intervales below the falls of said Onion River and pitched my tent by a large pitch pine tree nearly opposite to an island about one and a half miles below the falls, where I had observed large intervales on both sides of the river and landed for the first time I ever set foot on the fertile soil of the Onion River at the lower end of the meadow now known by the name of the Old Fields, where I discovered from my boat an opening like cleared lands. I went up the open meadow where the blue joint grass was thick till in sight of a large and lonely elm. Computing the open fields at 50 acres, I was much pleased with this excursion, promising myself one day to be the owner of that beautiful meadow. And he did. Uh, the Allens were quite known for this. Um, but what's notable is he talks about cleared lands of at least 50 acres. And subsequent generations of scholars now know that that was not natural clearing. That was Native American clearing for agriculture. And indeed, uh, one uh, series of quotations that you might not be familiar with, I certainly found it sort of by happenstance uh, last year, was, um, written by Daniel Charles Sanders, the first president of uh, the University of Vermont. Uh, in 1828, he wrote this uh, after he had retired, called The History of the Indian Wars, which is one of these early sort of treatises that tries to synthesize every you know, uh, battle across North America. But because he was situated in Vermont, uh, one chapter was devoted to Native American studies in Vermont. And he has these particular insights about um, about uh, Winooski in 1828 or thereabouts. Indian cornfields are plainly to be seen in various parts of Vermont. At the intervals in Burlington, several hundred acres together were found by the American settlers entirely cleared, not a tree upon them. The lands perfectly level, the soil made by vernal freshets, and then which there can be no richer land. And then on the Onion River, this is more notable archeologically, if, if somewhat more tragic. On the Onion River, opposite Burlington, the bank washed away by the, by the water discovered a vast quantity of bones of various sorts and sizes for more than 10 rods in extent. The horns of deer were yet distinguishable. In digging a few feet among the several things found was the edge part of an Indian iron hatchet, which had been cracked and broken off at the eye. From the whole scene throughout, the thought hurried itself into mind that this was a burying ground for the natives at a time when it was customary to bury provisions for the nourishment and instruments for defense with the bodies of the deceased when they made their journeys to the country of the souls. Now, um, you know, that was a common um, and stereotypical and somewhat uh, simplistic um, summary of their belief systems, but nevertheless quite remarkable um, that uh, an enormous um, Native American cemetery had, had this time in the 1820s likely washed into the river, and that the iron implements mean it was quite recent in time, from probably you know the 1700s by the time, or maybe late 1600s by the time those trade goods got into this region. Again, um, a cautionary tale for archaeologists here about the resources that may yet still be here, but also about uh, the erosion that was already being caused at this time. And um, Native Americans didn't haphazardly, um, despite what you know um, many stereotypically said, they wouldn't bury their dead in, in, in spots prone under normal conditions to immediate erosion. Um, rather, this was probably a new phenomenon that went on. Um, and probably one of the most important reasons uh, for the intervale for Native Americans, uh, or the Abnaki in this region, was um, the growing of corn and beans and squash. Um, an early plate by DeVry. Uh, this is by John White. And then more locally, um, the Abnaki folks. Um, and a last thing about uh, it, the general features of the Winooski is that it was uh, a primary artery of uh, transportation and travel. Um, you know, as I believe I said in the last talk, for those of you who are here, the rivers were Native Americans' natural highways. They uh, cut through what was otherwise uh, an often rugged and forested land. 
Um, and uh, this would have been the equivalent of a superhighway. Um, with notable portages at the falls and other places, this would have been a broad, wide river with which to make uh, uh, journeys quite quickly uh, out into the lake and then up into the hinterlands. And we'll talk about some of this. Early um, archaeologists noted in and around the Intervale um, things like Native American pot, or not early archaeologists, early settlers and others um, saw things like Native American pottery in and around this region. But there was a very, very incomplete uh, understanding, almost complete lack of understanding, about how recently the Native Americans had occupied the Intervale prior to the Allens and, and the early settlers. So with that as background, I'd like to talk about some uh, particular sites in this area. Again, looking at this LIDAR, um, the, the red and, and multicolored areas uh, get um, progressing, increasingly high in elevation. And you can see the bottomland all almost uniformly at you know, 105, 108 feet, uh, just slightly above the Winooski River itself. And here are um, all of the archaeological sites we have documented in the Intervale right now. Um, there are many other archaeological collections that have been um, sort of, you know, we've been alerted to, but don't, don't have a precise provenience or location for them. So while we know that a lot of people have found artifacts here in the past, if we can't tie them to a specific location, we can only say that they're from this general area. Um, and this area was uh, prior to my time, but in the mid 2000s, designated one of the few archaeological districts in Vermont, um, meaning that it has a special significance and that the sites themselves tell a cohesive story um, in, over and above the individual sites, but that they, they are um, somewhat related in, in space and in time. Um, and uh, the black here, which is sort, sort of tough to see, is the boundaries of the uh, district. So, Starting at the archaeological beginning, so to speak, um, one of the first, uh, or the first really serious uh, documentation of um, the archaeological richness of the Interville uh, was done by my uh, mentor and friend Jim Peterson uh, in the late 1970s uh, as part of his PhD work, or work for the Vermont Archaeological Society in UVM, which eventually became his PhD, on the Winooski side of the river. Um, here uh, at um, w, or VTCH 46, otherwise known as the Winooski site. Just another view here. Here's um, the, the uh, used to be the carpet factory, um, then became various other things. Most recently was DR Trimmer Mower, but I've, I've recently heard that they're going to be closing that operation, unfortunately. Um, and then all of this area here, essentially, and if you go back, you can really see um, the, well, maybe you can't, but um, you can see how, whoop, that, that. Um, you can see how this is bounded. Um, this is artificial. This is, uh, you know, the, the, um, the uh, rail trestle and, and system, but how this is bounded by um, this higher terrain. So before there was a carpet factory there, um, this had long been known informally as a place where people would stumble upon artifacts when walking along the river or fishing. Um, and, uh, and Jim and, and the Vermont Archaeological Society and uh, UVM did a joint excavation in the mid to late 70s where they really uncovered um, you know, a, a vast, rich um, Native American presence here, primarily dating to the middle uh, or to late woodland, so between about 2,000 years ago to the time of European contact, with the majority of the occupations here being the middle woodland from about, for the purposes of the dis this discussion, about 2,000 years ago to about 1,000 years ago. Here's some just interesting slides we recently scanned. And a problem, you know, that we're facing just parenthetically is that, you know, this was pre-digital, obviously, and um, many of the slides from these early excavations are rapidly fading and yellowing. And so I'm trying to get some interns to come in and, and scan them before they're unrecognizable. And you'll see some of those in a minute. You can see here, somewhat difficult, but all of these rocks here are a vast roasting pit. Um, and you can see all the flood sediments above. Um, a post from an old structure right here. Um, people returned in 1995 for a field school here. 
and again in different part here's the berm to the to the uh, trestle right there <coughs> I don't know why we were taking black and white in 1995 but oh well <laughs> and uh, and just remarkable things came out again um, floodplains archaeologically are very important because a Native American group will come stay at a particular site camp live and eventually they will leave and then um, at a certain later time, the river will flood, deposit a, a layer of uh, sterile sediment over that. Then another Native American group will come later. And so through the millennia, you get this layer cake-like thing where they're all separated in time and you can see how things have changed. And that is really what was here in evidence at the Winooski site and some of the others I'll be showing in a minute. A vast amount of Native American pottery uh, came out from this um, excavation and in fact enabled Jim to formulate a series of decorative changes through time that we still use today um, and finally published with a lot of reference to other sites in 1991 which is the system we all northeastern archaeologists uh, utilize today and came from these early excavations on the Winooski site. Um, these whole pots with um, you know these beautiful what we call drag stamp or taking a tooth tool and going like this at an angle throughout to make these remarkable decorative motifs um, notched rims and again um, what he derived from this the early woodland only fabric paddling or taking the edge of the um, a fabric wrapped dowel and pressing it into the pot um, we think as archaeologists that might this might have had a def decorative significance but was more likely <coughs> to drive air bubbles out of the pottery um, so that it wouldn't fire uh, uh, wouldn't explode in an open firing uh, but then quickly going into a variety of decorative motifs through time, including cord wrap stick, which is a very uninventive uh, name for a cord wrap stick. Um, <laughs> rocker dentate, where um, you would take a tooth tool, but you would rock it on a Z thing like this. And then pseudo scallop, which is a very interesting horizon beginning around 2100 years ago and continuing to about um, 17, 1600 years ago, where on the coast they would take the edge of a scallop shell, which had this wavy line, and use that to decorate pots. But it was such a compelling design motif that people in the interior here would remake it, likely out of wood, or even perhaps trade scallop shells into the interior to recreate these pots. Um, spear points. Um, dating from uh, the middle woodland or again around this 1600, 1700 year time period. Um, and then later these triangles which connote a, a, a strict shift to bow and arrow technology beginning around 1000 AD uh, made out of local quartzite. Um, and again just a Native American timeline here showing where this span was. They did find some evidence of what we call late archaic or, um, or uh, around three to 4,000 year old um, fire pits uh, deep down, but they were very ephemeral in light. Nothing like the massive amount of uh, occupation that was evidenced during this woodland period of from 3,000 years ago on, and particularly from about 2,000 years ago on. Uh, one of the most remarkable things about the Winooski site was their variety of um, floral food remains they um, were able to analyze. Um, so, Foods, butternut, black walnut, hickory, oak, hazelnut, uh, lamb's quarters or pigweed, fire cherry, black ras or blackberry or raspberry, staghorn sumac, hog peanut, snowberry, <laughs> buckwheat. Um, and then a variety of other um, medicinal uses and then, and then dyes. Um, showing not only um, giving us an insight into what Native Americans utilized, but also the richness of the Intervale area itself. Uh, and a public um, outreach document was, uh, was published out of that, um, which is now available online. Uh, I recently scanned it, and even though it's somewhat dated, uh, I thought it should still be, it still stands as an important document. Um, moving on. How are we doing? All right. Um, we'll move over to the Ethan Allen Homestead area itself. Uh, shortly thereafter, a number of things began to be uh, proposed for the intervail. Um, both to try to assess the, the hydrological dynamism and other things, uh, improvements, some related to the connector, others just, um, you know, with the increased pace of development. So here we have here 
the homestead itself, which is an archaeological site designated VTCH 136 in our inventory, or the 136th site in Chittenden County for which we have documentation. Um, we knew about this before, but for some reason this got listed before, which is VTCH 96. And in the LIDAR, you can really see what an interesting landform this is coming out under these lower, you know, often inundated, um, in, inundated low-lying fields. And just above it, we have this neat little peninsula where the Native Americans would have been somewhat drier, but had immediate access to probably their cornfields out here. And how do we know that? Oh, yeah, don't want to give short shrift. I just grabbed one slide from this. Um, but uh, various archaeological excavations that have been done here um, for, found a variety of somewhat mixed, um, not altogether um, full of integrity uh, historic artifacts and some Native American artifacts on the site through time. But then VTCH 94, the corn so cob site, otherwise known as the, oh, that's, uh, sorry, that's 96, but um, <coughs> anyway. Um, Again, uh, dug in 1979, um, you can see a very deep feature here with some fire cracked rock, other, the remains of fire hearths here. Um, interesting suite of stone tools, but more uh, interesting is the pottery um, uh, that came out that has a variety of decorative motifs. Um, but the fire hearths are what were potentially most interesting about this because um, in this particular one, this subtle basin-shaped uh, remains of a fire pit, they found what so far has been the only intact corn cob uh, on the intervale from the pre-contact era, dated to about 1400 AD. But um, likewise, they found at this general site area uh, butternuts that also date to roughly the uh, same time period, indicating to Pamela Bumstead and, and Pete Thomas, who published this, and which I just revisited last night, that they weren't fully invested in agriculture to the exclusion of other things, like many other Native American groups were by this time, but were still had a robust collecting strategy where they were going out and getting uh, butternuts, collecting things, and then probably augmenting them with maize. So not fully invested in this agricultural lifestyle. We have to. Uh, investigate this more, but it, it seems likely. And then also uh, an ephemeral fire pit that they dated to almost 3,000 years ago, showing um, the use of this landform through the woodland period. And again, um, that's where this site was. And I'm not sure why it's not advancing, but hmm. any idea? Battery maybe did? Oh, did I turn it off? That's a total possibility. No. Well, uh, can someone advance my slides? Good. Yeah, I'm still I'm still dead here, so might have to just ask. Yeah, all right, great. Um, moving into the central portion of the intervale, if we just want to advance forward. Um, you can see this really interesting, I mean, just to give you an idea of the LIDAR um, and how detailed it is, you can see the individual uh, furrows um, from you know, uh, the plowing. Um, and you can see this very dynamic oxbow system here. And uh, in, uh, again in 1979, Pete Thomas came out as part of the newly formed uh, UVM Consulting Archaeology Program to do some survey um, and these were the deepest excavations that have been done on the intervale thus far. Next slide, please. Um, so we're going to start up there at VTCH 146. Next slide, please. Otherwise known as the McNeil Barrow site. Um, here's a, here's a, a, a map of um, what the excavations were like. And these are not typical in Vermont. This, they knew the soils were so deep that they did a bunch of backhoe trenches and then augmented that with augers. And um, I mention this only because I'm kind of proud of myself, because uh, a couple days ago, uh, my colleague Scott, who worked on this in, in the late 1970s, said, you know, I would love to be able to relocate where those pits were. But it's so hard because our permanent datum was the fire tower, which is gone now, and all this stuff. And I said, oh, I think I can do it. So next slide. Um, I matched up these old oxbow oh. systems, and then um, and re-put them with the LIDAR with this you know, really remarkable uh, spatial control I have, I was able to match it up. Um, and then next slide, um, next slide. 
then map, because I had that map georeferenced, then put up where the test pits were. So now, now he's all excited. Now he's like, well, maybe we go out and do something now. So, so stay tuned. Um, next slide. So remarkable uh, depth uh, to uh, the uh, floodplain deposits here. Um, I couldn't find a picture, but there is a famous picture of Pete Thomas, a young Pete Thomas, way at the bottom of this that would never pass OSHA muster now. I mean, it's like so dangerous. And he's just sitting on the bottom traveling away. Um, but uh, I'll show a few sides of this. Next slide. Um, how deeply they go. And it's a little bit hazy here. Oh, hey, did it come back? Um, it's a little bit hazy here, but you can see these, you know, uh, just lenses of flood deposits just going back in time over thousands of years. Well, I still have this, but for some reason this isn't working. Oh, well. Anyway, so um, very, very deep, about 15, 16 feet down. Um, and a closer view. Next slide. Um, and within this, uh, intermittently and not large, because um, the testing was so broad uh, that we, they weren't really able to hone in on particular areas of um, Native American habitation and sort of do a decreased sampling. This was just a broad survey. So it was wherever they happened to find stuff. And yet, they found quite a bit of stuff. Um, continuing on. This is a diagram of the, all the various um, flood deposits. And you can see that many of them were in an old channel. Mm -hmm. You saw the dynamism here, and that's why they're lipped up near the end. Next slide. Um, kind of tough to see, but um, the remains of fire pits here. Next slide. Um, and notably, at three meters down, you can see three meters uh, it, or at uh, two and a half meters down, so roughly seven, they came upon a, a human crea uh, cremation uh, dated to around uh, 3,600 years ago. Next slide. I won't show the images themselves. Oh, wait. Here's some, some of the few artifacts, scrapers, one of these uh, uh, Lavana or um, triangle spear points that dates to about 1,000 years ago um, near a fire hearth dating to that time period. Um, uh, small numbers of Native American pottery that we can date through stylistic motifs through this 2,000 year period. Next slide. Uh, and then um, I won't show the human remains themselves, but a diagram of the, of the calcined bone related to a, um, a human cremation. Next slide. Um, and the parts that they were able to recognize. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, so from that uh, really remarkable um, insight, uh, we could say uh, that you know, virtually the entire um, inner veil out there, even as, much, even as, as d dynamic as it was, and certainly some areas were clearly destroyed by recent alluvium. You saw that. But other areas remained intact, particularly for this late woodland period. Um, later on, uh, Vermont Gas Systems wanted to run some propane lines, so they did some other trenching. Uh, next slide. And again, um, Large trenches run through, and we took this opportunity to look at all the floodplain stratigraphy, varied but showing various lenses of dark material that show stable surfaces and may indicate that Native Americans were living on those surfaces through time. Did find some artifacts in various places too. Next slide. Next slide. Um, just showing people working in the late 70s. You can see the McNeil plant in the back. Next slide. Um, various uh, Native American fire hearths again. Next slide. And then we move on to the McNeil site itself. Um, the McNeil generating plant was an early site, again, that was done by the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program. Next slide. Um, down in this area, again, just on the other side of the river from the famous Winooski site. Next slide. Um, and again, just showing the, the topography. But once you get back near uh, the McNeil plant, um, the, uh, there's still flood episodes, but they're probably, you know, what, what would be the equivalent of thousand year floods. Many of them didn't quite get to cover over that area with such depth. It's a little bit higher up, if any of you have ever, ever been out there. Um, and it probably just got the most severe flooding. So there was some flood separation, but not like way out on the uh, inner veil. Next slide. And again, close up of this area. Obviously, um, quite disturbed due to, uh, the building of the generating plant, and a lot of the uh, farm and industry that was going on down uh, in this particular location from the early 1800s on. Next slide. Um, but the, uh, there was some work done at the McNeil plant and around it in the, uh, in the 1980s. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Just showing 
what it looked like in the early 80s. Next slide. I tried, you know, I tried to find a, a picture just of the, um, of the landfill when it was open on the internet. I couldn't find one. I, I guess there's a collective forgetting, but I remember going on the, on the belt line when I was a kid and seeing it right out there and the tractors driving all over it and the seagulls everywhere. And, and uh, you know, it's remarkable. I was just driving here today and it's all treat now. I mean, it's just, it's really remarkable, but, um, but oh well. Uh, um, and again, a series of fire hearths um, and other things, um, uh, many of which contained butternut, none of which were contained maize in these, but again, to the same time period, continuing on. And continuing. And some of the things, again, a remarkably similar suite of tools from the other side of the river and from farther out. These Jack's Reef Corner Notch Middle Woodland uh, spear points, again, made out of local materials. Um, next slide. Um, and then some later triangles from the late woodland made out of quartzite. Next slide. And then a wide variety of pottery showing uh, a variety of decorative motifs. Next slide. Uh, more recently, just some supplemental work uh, back in the area of early digital. Um, you can see people out there. Next slide. And then um, we thought that we knew the, the, the limits of the McNeil site, but um, when uh, there was going to be some work done at the Intervale, uh, there was some archaeology again done by the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program. They were going to do various things like, next slide, um, move the Calkins barn over or, or move the barn over and do other um, various improvements. And so an archaeological was, investigation was undertaken around that area to see what might be found. And, and um, largely in the supplemental area um, over here, um, a lot of Native American artifacts were found, but they were sort of displaced, interspersed with historic things, indicating that it was once, much like the rest of the McNeil plant area, um, very heavily occupied by Native Americans, but not a lot of integrity left. Continue on. Um, just a, an overview of aerials uh, to show the change through time. This is pre-plant, 1937 aerial, a rare early area of this area. This is 1962. Next. Uh, and it's a close-up of the 1962. This again is 1999, and by that time the Intervale Center's there. Next, what? 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 Yep. Yep. All right. And then post 2000. Again, a, a zooming um, uh, view. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, various changes that have happened since 1962 and 2004. Um, and next slide. So uh, as part of these changes, um, UVM did some work on the Intervale Center side of the road. And while they did find some disturbance, they actually found, uh, next slide, um, next slide, so that uh, in many areas there was modern fill, probably to level the area out. That's this sort of light stuff here, but underneath there was still intact soil deposits, many of which contain Native American artifacts, particularly um, pottery. Um, and John Kroc and UVM Anthropology Department and subsequently did a field school down here, recovered many more remains. Um, next slide. And again, it's, that's very clear here. You can see that, that sort of fill or flood packet, um, but below which there were intact artifacts. Next slide. And then particularly this area right by the river, which was a berm made for this pond, but underneath the berm there was still um, intact uh, Native American deposits. And then other work for hoop houses, again, just getting these little windows into the deep flood stratigraphy uh, that we've documented various placements around the interville. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And uh, I don't want to forget um, the historic resources in the intervale. Um, many of you have probably seen uh, this uh, work by Britta, um, recently done for the Intervale Center, just documenting the Calkins farmstead here. And I can read it, a classic example of an Italianate style architecture. The farmhouse was built in 1868 for George Reynolds and occupied by his family through 1907. Various tenant farmers lived on the property and operated the dairy until 1937, when Ella Calkins moved to the farm alone and took it over. Her daughter, Rena, joined her in 1941 and continued living in the farmhouse and operating the farm until 1991. The house is a classic example of an Italian style farmhouse with a high degree of historic integrity. 
Exterior features such as the decorative window moldings, porches with elaborate carvings, double entry door and slate roof are characteristic defining features of the Italianate style. And again, credit to Britta who did a remarkable sort of flyer uh, for the Intervale Foundation or the Intervale Center and, and uh, I think you can get it online. Really great. Um, and so yes, um, it was an operating farm um, and, and uh, but as many of you know, uh, the Intervale, after the sort of agricultural boom in the 1970s, fell into some disrepair. It was used as a dump. It was, it was, uh, you know, and then it had a formal landfill there. Um, but it's really seen a, a, um, a resurgence in recent years, um, and is used for probably the purpose that it was used for millennia now, largely, which is agriculture. Although, um, you know, as uh, others have noted, particularly that master student, Catherine Blomson. Many people more recently are weighing um, the benefits and detriments of, um, of the vast floods that have, uh, you know, make it a gamble to, to um, farm out there. The soil is very fertile, but uh, the danger uh, of losing your crop is significant. I just want to end with um, saying that the Intervale wasn't certainly the only era, area uh, that was uh, popular for Native Americans, particularly in this later phase, this woodland period. Um, farther up, you can recognize the airport here. Uh, um, in the back road, National Guard Road, they were, um, well, they have now expanded the National Guard, Air National Guard Center. Um, and, but prior to doing that, uh, uh, several consultants ending up with the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program that did the, the detailed phase three work um, documented, next slide, um, a major, uh, what was determined to be Native American village dating to um, for those of you here before, I think I mentioned this site because it is remarkable. Um, there, were, there were six, five or six radiocarbon dates run on various things. Two on maize or corn that was discovered at this site uh, in a fire pit and in a storage pit. Uh, two on butternut. Again, this interesting mix of, of uh, naturally harvested nut trees and then maize augmenting and one on hop hornbeam, uh, you know, a wood species. And all of them came out to the exact same radiocarbon date. It, I've never had that happen in Vermont. Normally they're all over the place and then you gotta bend your mind around what, what's wrong. But they all came out to 1315 AD um, after the calibration. And uh, extens we, we'll go through some of these slides here. Uh, next slide. Um, there, the two major blocks were done on either side of this sort of swale. And we hypothesized that the base of the swale actually was a spring that's been infilled. Um, and so once it would have probably been a village that was arrayed around this um, spring in the middle. Next slide. Um, you can see here again um, the radiocarbon dates uh, all showing. And the blues are positive test pits or test pits that had Native American artifacts. Um, there's very few reds. And you can see um, we only excavated where they were going to put the road. So the rest is still preserved. Uh, and, and lockly, locked safe away behind the National Guard fences. Um, uh, but we only saw very little of a massive, probably um, Native American uh, village. Next slide. Um, just showing the, this is non-depositional now, so we're up uh, off the floodplain. Next slide. Um, but that black is all a living surface. Basically, um, the soil made organically rich by just people living on it for so long. Um, and then interspersed in that, a series of um, features, storage pits, fire hearths, next slide, which you can see here, next slide. Um, and then, you know, as archaeologists do, we took every little piece of lithic debitage and mapped it to 50 by 50 centimeter squares and a particular 10 centimeter depth and put them all into an Excel spreadsheet and then ran these contour analysis to see where the densest um, things are, and you can see this clear density. And then the blues are the, um, the two north and south are fire pits. Um, the center in the middle is a fire pit. And then there's various refuse and storage pits around it. Um, here's a very characteristic late woodland bell-shaped jar, for, or I mean bell-shaped pit for storing corn, but completely empty, indicating that they ate all the corn and took it out. And what's left is just the, uh, out, you know, the, rem the remnant. Next slide. And just showing some other um, detailed in the other block, detailed heat maps, and then where we found all the late woodland um, arrowhead, Lavana spear um, arrowheads. Next slide. And again, a close up view. Next slide. And then where we found all the, um, you know, the Lavana projectile points here, hundreds of them. It was remarkable. Next slide. 
And then what we hypothesized from all that mapping is that we identified probably a portion of one Native American um, elongated house. I hesitate to use the formal term long house, which is much more Iroquoian, but an elongated house, much of which was um, on one end was disturbed by National Guard Road. Yep. And then um, a series of other late woodland sites around this area as well. So not just the Intervale, but another node further up the Winooski River that shows um, intensive late woodland occupation through time. But what was notable about National Guard Road is it was off the floodplain. It was nestled into sort of a knoll. All of the wood that we found there, with the very few exceptions like that hop hornbeam, was jack pine, which now there's less than 500 acres in Chittenden County, but was once a major forest type, encompassing something like 20,000 square acres. Um, and it seems like they might have burned it down to form the village. Um, and they probably kept up there in the winter, nestled from the winds, but still um, in close proximity to the Winooski River itself, um, able to access their stores. So rounding out this seasonal movement, and then finally, I'll just go through this very quickly because I know I'm almost out of time. Continue. Um, Camp Johnson showing another view on a tributary of the Winooski interior. Um, you can see it there. Um, next slide. Uh, showing the other extent, these logistical hunting forays by probably a few Native American hunters into the woods. We, we strongly suggest or think that this was a deer yard. Um, a very small, just sort of fire pit, you know, roughly about this thing. And surrounding it was, we tested many, many test pits and didn't find a thing. And then we got to this one. Next slide. And next slide. And we found all of these spear points and the remains of the legs of a deer um, and, um, and uh, radiocarbon dated uh, plant foods. And so we get this remarkable picture of what looks like a couple hunters going out, you know, capturing a deer, eating the legs, because those were probably the part that they could, you know, feast on without, you know, um, destroying the whole meal and then probably bringing the rest of the carcass back um, for food in the, in the fall or winter. So we get this whole seasonal round. And when we begin to synthesize all of these archaeological sites, not just these concentrations on the Airvale, but throughout the basin and throughout Vermont, we can begin, and we're just starting to do this now, get this nuanced picture of Native American life through time across space and really begin to fill out um, the remarkable histories and pasts of these, of, of these folks. So uh, with that, I'll leave it. And uh, thanks very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Just that they're triangular. Although some people call them triangles, you know, the, the, the term that we use, which was left over from the archaeologist that originally defined the type, was Lavana, which is based upon an old estate in New York State. It has no reference to anything real. But some people just call them triangles because they're ubiquitous um, across the Northeast around this time period, post 1000 AD. Um, they just start going up everywhere, and they're very easy to manufacture. The toughest thing with, with Lavanas is getting them thin enough so they would have been hafted, but otherwise they're very easy to manufacture, um, and they were small and could be slotted into arrows versus the larger things that were meant for spears. And so it's, you see this change in technology. They, and they also seem to, um, uh, this is an oversimplification, but they stop seeming to care about their form as much. They're much more expedient. They'll just quickly chip something out, put it on, and then post-contact, we begin to see this same triangular form um, be replicated out of um, iron, brass, other things. Mm -hmm. So they're continuing to put them on um, um, arrows, but now they're u utilizing the new metal resources that are coming in. Yeah? Do we have any estimates at all on what Indian population numbers were during the Northeast period? Yeah, this is a great question. And, uh, Someone brought this up in March, and, and like I, I said then, and I will say it now, it is a very troubling. Um, yeah, they, they were nomadic. In yeah, it is. It is so problematic, and it and yet it's so important as baseline data to try to figure other things out about life ways. But um, every time someone attempts it, some other archaeologist will just come out and say like, "That's ridiculous." Blah, blah. I mean, it's it's the most thankless job in archaeology is to try to figure out population densities. <laughs> Having said that, we are getting to a point now, at least in Chittenden, Addison County, where there's enough sites where if we really did a lot of 
GIS-based work about um, how many people at this particular site might have been able to you know, habitate there for a given period of time. Mm -hmm. And then extrapolating that out, and extra we might in some decent, you know, not too distant future, be able to give some estimates. Like at 1000 AD, the population we estimate in the Champlain Valley was this much, yeah. at least on the Vermont side. We're getting to that point. Having said that, you know, it's, it's, so it's tough. Good. Yeah, but there are some um, interesting anthropologists that have done work about um, what is the minimum uh, human population that can exist without dying out, um, you know, uh, that can, you know, yeah. s suffer the ebbs and flows of, um, you know, disease and famine. And, and those are very interesting t statistics. And it's likely for much of Vermont's prehistory that they weren't much above that. So the average band size um, might have been 50 to 100, 150 people, not, probably not more than that. It wasn't until this late woodland people were, uh, period when agriculture begins, even though, as I stressed, it's not totally relying upon agriculture like some other folks uh, were in, in the Ohio Valley or in the Mississippi Valley. Um, they were still augmenting it with a lot of natural foods. Um, but they probably had smaller population sizes, even if they were staying with their farm fields a little bit longer than they used to. So the, the best guess is for the, the total tribe sizes of different Indian nations would have really come with the, when the European settlers came in. Or the yeah, and, and, and there is, um, there's a book that, uh, it, you know, really um, has some, if, you know, as an archaeologist, I can nitpick with a lot of the nuances of what this author writes, but his name is Charles Mann, and he wrote a book called 1491, the year before Columbus came, what um, North America was like, or actually the Western Hemisphere was like. And he does a great job of synthesizing the broad strokes and basically saying that um, population estimates for North America at the, on the year before you know, uh, Columbus arrived were vastly underestimated. Yeah. There was probably you know, 50, 100 million people living you know, here. <laughs> right, yeah. and, and that previous estimates were very, very too, too, too low. Mm -hmm. um, and any case that we've looked at, in particular case studies, uh, particularly in the Northeast, which was contacted so early, um, you know, 90 to 95% of people died or, or had to flee or um, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise were hidden prior to anyone bothering to really begin to count. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's problematic. And yet using archaeological sites as a proxy is also problematic because we know we're only getting a sample of a sample of a, you know. Um, so these are, these are the various things that, you know, some, somebody would yell at you for as soon as you put out a paper. Um, <laughs> but any other questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah, great, great question. So um, it's the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation has a website. If you go there, I'm trying to think about this in my mind, and you go to the tab page on the left, you will see resources and rules. You want the resources, not the rules. <laughs> and then into that, you click on Digging Archaeology. And then in that, there's a series of publications. And many of them, you know, um, I will fully admit are dated. But once upon a time, the Division for Historic Preservation put forth some money or got a grant to have these things done. And I, I didn't want to see them go by the wayside. So I've actually been going through our old catalogs and rescanning them and putting them on. And, and with the caveat that we've learned a lot since they came out, you can get things like Jim's Seasons of Prehistory. You can get some other interesting things that were done in the 70s and 80s, some general reader's handbooks. And then I believe like Britta's um, uh, publication is on the Intervale Center's website. Um, and, and, and if you have any specific questions, you can always email me. Yeah. The technology that the Native Americans used in the Eastern Woodlands for making their spears and their arrowheads, that was pretty similar across the whole country, wasn't it? Well, broadly, the techniques were very similar, although only in the sense that they made stone tools with probably um, bone-handled things and then other harder stones. But if you talk to a flint napper or a person who recreates um, particular um, uh, spear point or arrowhead styles uh, using only the techniques that they would have had thousands of years ago, they will swear to you that there are a variety of differing techniques that were utilized. And, and they, they have good evidence to support that. So some people just used direct percussion, you know, using a, a, a billet or a, a hammer on stone. Others uh, say that they used indirect percussion or using like um, 
uh, what's called an Ishi stick because um, um, this sort of tragic story of this Native American that um, came out of hiding in the Great Basin in the late 1800s was named Ishi. And his technique for making spear points was to use like a, um, the weight of your body to chip them out like this on a long stick. So yes, broadly speaking, you know, they, man they use the same techniques, but when you get down into the nuances, actually they were quite different in quite different regions. And a lot of it depended upon the, the parent material that you were trying to work. If you could have, if you had obsidian nearby or happened to have it, you could almost blow on it and it would, you know, chip into, but something like quartzite, I mean, there's a quartzite quarry up in um, uh, near Little Rock Pond uh, in Mount Tabor, and um, it's kilometer long, and, and you probably not know what you're looking at until you went up there, but, but, but um, in certain areas, you can see them trying to break big cobbles of quartzite, and the only thing they can do is carry another giant boulder up like 10 feet on the cliff face and just drop it down on another, because it's the only way they can break it. It's so dense, and in fact, uh, my, my colleagues who do this, um, they've all got tennis elbow and they've had to stop napping quartzite because it just hurts too much. It's so dense. Um, so it's remarkable, even though some of this stuff seems rough, you know, like those up there, um, it's a remarkable achievement to actually make something out of the stone. It was not a very good stone. Um, very, very dense once you've finished it, but you know, you probably have to take a nap afterward, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, Duncan. Jess, Jess, how many sites are there now in Vermont that have produced physical evidence of corn? Oh, corn. Yeah, corn. that's a great corn. question. Corn. So yeah. that it's it's increasing, you know, almost every season. So prior to this, prior to about three or four years ago, there were uh, four sites. There was the Winus or the the corn cob site, or otherwise known as the Donahue site. There was um, the Bohannon site up in Alberg. There was uh, the Skichewag site down uh, on the lower Connecticut in Windsor. Very recently, there has been many more. There is another site in Alberg. There uh, is the headquarters and porcupine sites on Route 78 in Swanton, a massive excavation that found a lot of corn in a very similar circumstance to the Winooski, uh, an alluvial floodplain, um, the very, very dense home to Native Americans, the homeland of Missisquoi Abnaki from, you know, uh, for the last 10,000 years probably. Um, and again, village size settlements, in fact, including the first definitive remains of a longhouse up there, um, dating to around this late woodland period. Um, but then um, uh, the first sites on the Otter Creek that have had corn have come out just recently in the last two years. In fact, the report isn't even done yet, so I can't even fi finish, you know, tell you in more detail. So the more that we're looking, the more that we're finding, and that it wasn't just, although limited to probably these major river valleys, a variety of locales did evidence corn. Yeah? In showing us all these sites in, on the Intervale, et cetera, how can you protect them from somebody going over there and deciding to do their own dig mm -hmm. and ruining everything? Well, I, well here's, here's what I'll say about that. Um, there is an agricultural exemption. So agriculture is, is protected. And so if people want to do that during the course of agriculture, with, with some specific exceptions, which I'm not going to get into now. Um, uh, they can, by and large, do that. Um, when certain things are below ground, um, there's, you know, we sometimes go out. This does have um, not some overly burdensome protections, but as a state, um, this, you know, archaeological district, um, it, uh, you know, we're mindful of that. But there's a lot of things that you can do. Now, if it's commercial development, if you need a permit, an Act 250, a 248 permit, if you're expanding generation facilities, that will have to be reviewed just like anything else. Um, but, you know, it's become increasingly clear that uh, other than farming or, you know, potentially uh, electric, you know, conduit or something like that, um, the dynamism is making it, you know, difficult to do anything out on the, on the floodplain. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, certainly Intervale Compost is a, is a case study in that where they eventually had to move because of the threat of flooding and the, the massive scale operations there. Um, in terms of individuals digging, if you're, if you're going out with a specific purpose to dig an archaeological site, um, it is the, it is, if it's private land, that is the owner's um, property with the exception of human remains, which there is a protocol for if they're found. 
Uh, it's the owner's property, and, and not specifically Intervale here, but just in Vermont. Um, if they're not going to be developing and they allow someone to just go and dig up their lawn, then that's perfectly acceptable. You know, however I much, you know, would not necessarily condone that or perhaps try to steer them into more constructive endeavors, um, it is property rights are sacrosanct and they can, they can do or allow others to do what they want on their own land. Yeah. You hear the word intervail so much. What exactly is an intervail? Yeah, so you might have walked in a little late. This was one of the first slides I showed. It's actually an early, it's taken from a Native American term, but it, it, it was um, anglicized early on to essentially mean a very fertile um, valley between <coughs> mountains. Um, and, you know, nothing suits that like the <coughs> Burlington Intervale. But there are other intervales. And if you read 19th century literature, they talk about intervales, sometimes called intervals, um, quite often in the literature. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of those New England terms, much like um, uh, um, I just saw a presentation a few days ago about Vermont's greens, you know, their, their town greens. And that's sort of a vermont -y term. In other areas, they use the term common. But here in Vermont, we prefer green. Um, so there's these regional sort of, um, you know, old Anglo anglizations of, of uh, words and concepts. So. Well, I think now oh. it's all right. Yes, there was. You, you just yes. What happened to it? I don't know, except it got taken down, much to the dismay of my friend who tied all of his archaeological datums oh. into that fire tower. <laughs> but technology saved us. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot, folks. sitting over by the window, Bob Compton. When you're out on a uh, foliage ride, if you go down towards Bristol, I would highly recommend you stop in through his shop, which is about, what, maybe two miles from downtown Bristol? Yeah. On the left-hand side of Route 116, and uh, you can talk to Bob before he leaves. Uh, it's a great place to visit. They, have, they make fantastic items there. I, so I thought it, I should recognize you for that, Bob. A uh, couple of things going on here at the homestead. On October 14th, we are having our first ever harvest dinner. There are these little flyers on the table. You can pick one up for yourself. Maybe bring one back to wherever you're going and uh, to help to promote it. And look, I think it's going to be a great, uh, a great first time event here at the homestead. October 14th, that's a Saturday. On the following day, it's the third Sunday of the month, so we're having our, our next talk. And, the gentleman coming is uh, Paul Gillies, who has been here once before. He is a lawyer, and he has written a book on early Vermont laws. And he has lots of stories, many of them numerous, about uh, some of the court cases in the very early days of Vermont. So hopefully you'll come to that. On your way out, on the right-hand side, we have some new arrivals. If you have grandchildren, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, or great, great, great grandchildren. Uh, there are some books over there for young readers that we have about five new titles that just came in on Friday, so you might check those out. And then please help yourself with the refreshments on the left hand side on your way out, too. All right, and thank you all for coming.